Good morning, Frank. Uh, good morning, Jessica. Joseph, good morning, Alex, good morning. Okay, guys, so today is literally my favorite topic to speak about, to be totally honest with you guys. Um, I have a few things that I wanna roll into and then I'm gonna open it up with questions and answers uh, for you guys. If everyone could unmute themselves unless you have a question that you could raise your hand or jump into that. Just, I don't wanna go in and have to mute everybody. Good morning, Craig, good morning, Judy. Okay, so um, the biggest thing that I really want to speak about is that regardless of what business you guys are in, majority of us on this call are all real estate agents or real estate brokers, that this doesn't just apply for real estate people. This actually applies for any business owner. What you guys have to do is you guys have to master your business. And once you're able to master your business, then you could take the money from that business and put it into real estate because that is really what I'm so passionate about. So the funny thing is that, you know, everybody always looks at me as this real estate agent, right? With, uh, that's had a lot of success and built a really, really incredible business. But really my main passion, my, my real passion, my real love is rental real estate. And that is literally the whole reason I got into real estate. Right. So the whole reason I got into real estate was just to be an inside player to start buying rental properties. So what I, what, you know, it's funny that I had to build this incredible real estate business, but it really just made me the inside player. So rental real estate investment, real estate is my passion, is my hobby, is everything to me. The real estate brokerage and running the business and running a team and all of my other businesses and entities have one sole purpose to feed the real estate buying rentals and, you know, collecting doors to my portfolio. So that's really what it's all about. I know there's a lot of TV shows out there and a lot of people out there that uh, fix and flip, right? And fixing and flipping is very sexy. You know, people making checks, 50 grand, 100 grand is what you guys see on TV or on social media. There's really no TV shows or anything out there for people like myself and, because what we do is not sexy, but if you guys could do it for a long period of time, like myself and Jessica have been doing, you could really, really set yourselves up forever as we've set ourselves up, right? We set ourselves up, not just for our life, but for Brody and Brock's life. And probably if they're good stewards of what I give them, they can probably keep this rolling for their kids' kids, right? And the fixing and flipping just makes you a quick check, right? So I always feel like I have... I have a talent, right? I have a talent that I'm able to make a pile of money. Now you guys can make a pile of money uh, like Gerard used to have a, bit, uh, a restaurant. You can make it in running your diner, but a pile of money doesn't change my life forever. What does is a stream of income. And that's what's so special about rental real estate, right? Because they give us streams of income forever. And for myself, it started off very, very, very slowly right? So I'm going to bring you all the way back before I own multiple, you know, homes and before I own multiple uh, multifamilies. The first thing I did is Jessica and myself ran out and we bought a two family house, right? So at that time, and you guys probably have all heard the story a million times, myself and Jessica were living upstairs. We rented out the entire downstairs for $2,000 and our monthly mortgage payment was $1,900 a month. And that was my first property that I ever bought 15 years ago. And we were living there making $100 a month. And then it all started from there. And then from there, I got the real estate license. And I got the real estate license just to be the inside player and just to start to make a few little checks, right? I still had my day job, which was working construction. And then from there, we ran out and bought our second house. And what we did is we saved up enough money to purchase the second house. And then once we owned the second house and we were making $1,000 in passive income. And I was so blown away by that because I used to go to work back then and I used to make $500 a week. So I was so blown away that I was making $1,000 without having to do anything, right? Without having to work any harder. So to me, as soon as I bought that second property, which I'll tell you the story and I was super scared. As soon as I bought that second property, I was like, oh, wow, this is really what it's all about. Like everybody is working harder to buy something else and then the money's gone, right? Where if I work harder and I buy another rental, it will give me that stream of income forever, 
And then I got totally obsessed with what I uh, am doing today, which is buying rental real estate, right? So that I think that is probably one of the reasons why I got so passionate about my real estate business, because I needed to have uh, a flow where I can make money, right, at a high level uh, and not only make enough money to feed my family and take care of everybody, but also make enough extra income to start buying rentals. So my second rental that I ever bought, and don't think that I went into this and I was like, oh my God, buying houses sight unseen with tenants you know, in them and squatters in them. Today, that's what I do. But back then I remember sitting with my father, my dad, uh, name was Harvey, but we called him Steve. And we're sitting in his, he had this beautiful white infinity, you know, back in the day, uh, we're sitting there and I pull him up to this house, which is on Park Avenue and I still own it today. And I'm like, dad, I'm going to buy this house. And he says to me, literally says this to me, he's like, Beach, either stop talking about doing this or figure something else out. So basically what he said to me was because I was talking about buying rental houses probably five years prior to that. And this is probably, I bought the first house at 20 or 21. And that was the one that Jessica and myself lived in the two family. This is probably 22. I didn't even, I think I just got the real estate license, right? And maybe I sold two or three houses that year. And he was like, stop talking about it or do it. And it was really blunt because he always was very positive to me, but he kind of was like, listen, Brian, either you got to pull the trigger on this and get past your fear or you have to figure out something else to do with your life and your main goal. And the first rental house that I ever bought, I had an extra account literally saved up with like, if shit hits the fan account, right? So I was so afraid, like, what if the tenants don't pay? What if the boiler breaks? What if the roof blows off, right? So I ended up buying that second property. And then I was $1,000 a month in positive passive income. And I thought like, this is the best thing since sliced bread. And then literally I just spent the next 15 years saving up every single dollar that we could make in the real estate business. And it's continuing to buy houses, buy houses, buy houses, buy houses. Um, what I basically look for is I look somewhere between an eight and 12% on my money. And what I mean by that is I want a, an eight to 10% cash on cash return. So if I was putting, let's just say, hypothetically, the house was $100,000, right? If the house was $100,000, I want to make sure I make on that 100 grand somewhere between 8 and 12%. Now, how do you come up with the 8 to 10, uh, 8 to 12% is you have to take out all of your expenses. So what I mean having expenses is basically what you have is when you own a rental property is there's multiple different expenses, right? You're going to have your taxes. I consider that a fixed expense. You're also going to have your insurance, right? So your renter's insurance on the property, don't have homeowner's insurance because you're no longer a homeowner, right? So your renter's insurance on the property, not that you're um, insuring the tenants, but you're insuring your dwelling in your house, right? So those are your fixed expenses. Then you have to allocate funds for, um, repairs. Okay. Then you also have to allocate funds, uh, for vacancy, even that in long Island, just like the real estate market, you know, everything is selling, uh, nonstop right now in rental real estate. I literally don't have one vacant door right now. And when you start, uh, buying rentals, you're going to count them as doors, right? Yes. You could say, Hey, I own X number of houses, but really what you start to do is you start to collect doors, right? And you know, when I'm at a, at a dinner party with other landlords, what we, what we boast about is who has the most doors, right? The goal is how do, you, how do you collect as many doors as possible? I sell houses for my clients, but I collect houses uh, for my family. So the, back to the expenses, you're gonna look at your taxes, you're gonna look at your insurance, right? You're going to look at your vacancies and repairs, and those are your fixed expenses, okay? You're going to have all of those on one side of your paper, and then your other side of your paper is going to be your revenue. And guys, I always looked at every one of my rental houses as its business. So as a lot of us are just, you know, born entrepreneurs, and that's really what I was, right? When I went, before I fell into this whole real estate thing, I was going to buy a Snapple route, I was going to buy a Boar's Head route, and all of those businesses I had to work in, right? Even the real estate business today, it, it's not a passive business, right? Regardless of how many people you have working for you and how big you get it, you're, you're still working in it, right? With rental real estate and with what I do is they're all passive. Once we, once we purchase the house, 
right? Rehab the house. Cause today I like to bring them down to the studs and redo them. And we'll talk all about that. But once I get them rented, basically I can add it to the portfolio and it spits off passive income every single month. As opposed, if I was going to go out and buy uh, back when I was, you know, in my early teens, I owned a, a piece of a bar. Well, that bar, I had to go in, I had to work. I had to worry about people stealing from me. I had to worry about, did we needed more liquor? Do we needed, you know, was the toilet clogged? But all of these houses, they're basically businesses, right? So I look at it today that I own multiple houses, but they're really just businesses that are all sitting behind me, spitting off money every single year. The way that Jessica and myself run our business is at the end of every single year, we take every dollar that is in our bank account, except our emergency fund, and we spend it. And you guys are probably saying, well, Brian, that, that sounds counterproductive to who you are. We know you, you, know, you, you don't really buy flashy things. They don't get you excited. But I spend every dollar in my bank account on real estate. Right. So the end of 2021, we ran out and we bought three more houses, right? Because we need to spend every dollar in the business, bring it back down to zero and add more houses to the portfolio. And that's really been our business model um, for the last 15 years was just Brian, continuing. Yes. You're bringing it down to zero because of tax implications. I'm bringing it down to zero, Dan. Um, I think that's who uh, speaking. Yep. I'm only, yep. Look at that. I know the voice. I'm bringing it down to zero because that's my mindset, Dan. My mindset is I've spent the entire year working my face off, right? Making as much money as possible and then being a good steward of the money and not spending it on stupid stuff that doesn't pay me every month. And then I bring the bank accounts down to zero because I spend all the money on real estate. And then what I do is then I got to start all over again the next year. Does so that make sense? You, so you, you're doing it to mentally create you to re-hustle all over again? Yes, I'm, I'm doing it mentally to tell myself that I'm starting back at zero, right? I, I, and I then like if, the if, you, if you do that for enough years, Dan, like I've been doing it almost uh, a decade and a half, you do that long enough, you're going to turn around and be like, holy shit. I own 20 houses, I own 25 houses, and it's spitting off so much money, right? Because sure. listen, the, the first decade, guys, and listen, if you're not gonna play a long game, then what I teach you is not the right strategy, right? But I'm law, uh, you know, we're all young. And I really mean that even if you're seven years old, we're all young, we all have a long life to still live. So I have played a long game and a long game only pays off now today. But the first two or three years of buying rentals stunk, right? Because the first house I was making a hundred bucks. The second one, you know, it took a lot of savings to buy the second one. All right, I'm making a thousand dollars. But listen, you, you can go out for a crazy dinner with friends and spend a thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that really wasn't that sexy. And then I had to go back into the business, right? Work again for maybe another year, another two years, another three years to buy the third. And now the third, I'm making two grand a month. Okay. And then the fourth, I'm making 2,500. And then the fifth, I'm making 3,500, 5,500, 10 grand, 15 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand a month in passive income, 40 grand. Right. So it starts off very slow, but why it starts to get momentum is because then you're able to start to use the passive income to live your life. But then the, the, the thing that most people mess up on is what they end up doing is they start to see this passive income coming in and they start spending it, right? They raise, they raise their lifestyle. What we did was we let the passive income come in, but we acted like it didn't even exist. And we also kept our lifestyle very level with everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. But we doubled down the business and the business was printing money, having incredible success. We took all that money and just kept buying and buying and buying and buying. And now we wake up almost 15 years later, right? And we have a portfolio that is incredible, that literally spits off enough money, you know, um, to take care of everything. Does that make is sense? There, is there a percentage that you're, you're keeping in reserves, whether, you know, it's a different account for, you know, the roof, the boiler breaking, uh, vacancy rates, you know, et cetera? Yeah. So the first one, I'm sitting next to my dad, Steve, and I was scared shitless. And I made sure I had an extra $10,000 in savings. 
just for that house. I had that house set up just with an extra 10K in case something went wrong. But then you start to build a tolerance. As I teach you to build a tolerance in your real estate business, as I teach you to build a tolerance in your fitness journey, right? And, and everything is you build a tolerance for it, right? Today, I have, I have 19 houses, 23 doors, right? And I don't have a, an emergency fund for just one house. I have a little block uh, of emergency fund for the entire portfolio. But the nice thing is, is that when you have a little uh, block of it, you're able to allocate uh, when things need to be done. The way that I really kind of designed my portfolio is it started off buying single family houses. And now we've changed it where we're buying more multifamily. The cool thing about the way that I started off the portfolio was a lot of investors, they buy for, there's two different ways of buying. You can buy for appreciation, okay? Or you can buy for cash flow. I buy a little bit for both, but I really buy for cash flow because cash flow is what um, pays my bills, right? Cash flow is what let, lets me live my life, okay? And that's really what I've always played for. You know, I'm watching, yes, all of my businesses, but the number that I know, and you could wake me up in the middle of the night and I will know exactly to the cent is how much passive income is coming in every single month for my family. And why? Because that's the most important thing, right? So I may not know exactly how many, how much money is coming in pending sales. I may not know how much um, money is coming from this one flip that I did. I may not know exactly some other, you know, uh, amount of money coming in, but what I know to the penny is passive income coming in. And I also know my lifestyle expenses because I want to make sure I am always financially free um, in that capacity to make sure there's more than enough passive regarding our expenses. So when you look at the two different ways of buying is a lot of uh, investors buy for appreciation and buying for appreciation is difficult because you're counting on the market always continuing to go up. The way I look at it is appreciation is gravy, right? I love my turkey dinner, but if you give me a little gravy, it just makes it even better. And what I mean by that is that that all of the houses go up in value. Yes, I promise you guys over a 20 year period, they will all with inflation, right? They will all go up in value substantially, but uh, I don't buy for appreciation, right? I buy for cash flow. So if I, and, and the reason why I will never get hurt, regardless if this market goes up, goes down, goes sideways, is because I've purchased for cash flow. So the tenants will always continue to pay and we will still be able to, you know, run the portfolio. And now only today, because right, I'm I'm the the white haired guy in the room with in the real estate game, is now only today am I starting to look at each property in my portfolio and say, you know what? Wow, I bought this house for one hundred eighty thousand dollars. Today it's worth five hundred twenty five. I'm no longer getting the eight to twelve percent return on my money. Let me sell it. Let me do a 1031 exchange and let me move that money to another property or two other properties that are paying me more. Uh, a few, and I'm, I'm gonna, I am going wanna leave a, plenty of time for questions because I'm sure you guys are all like up to here with questions, but a few other things just that I wanted to uh, put together for you guys is every single one of my properties I put in an LLC, okay? Uh, I put it in a limited liability company. And the reason I do that is because if there was, God forbid, ever uh, a major tragedy at that property, it will not take down the entire portfolio, okay? So each, remember, I look at each property as a business, right? So each business is its in separate LLC. And the way that we have everything structured is each property is in its own separate LLC. And then there is a parent, right? So all the properties are my kids. And then there's a parent LLC that manages, right? All of those properties. So what ends up happening is all of the tenants pay rent to our management company, not my, I own a property management company. That's a whole separate thing, but to, this is the car personal portfolio. All of the tenants, right? Have leases with the management company. They pay the management company, the money, each house sits in its own separate LLC. So God forbid there was some tragedy and we lost one of the houses, right? Because there was a fire, a flood, something crazy happened. It wouldn't take down the whole portfolio. And you, you, you know, you say, well, Brian, that's really, really, you know, either high level or Brian, that's really, really, you know, um, you know, strategizing it. But the way that I built a portfolio was very, very slowly, but I built it like a pyramid. 
right? And the reason I built it like a pyramid is because you could lose the top of the pyramid, but it will not crush the pyramid, right? Think I'm obsessed with uh, Egypt and uh, you know that empire, but it's so it's so incredible the way they built them because they built them strong. And this is the way that your businesses should be built. This is the way that your financial house should be built. And this is the way my portfolio is built. And now today, even though I take tremendous risk, right? I just, let me think about one of the craziest ones, but I'll, I'll buy rental properties with, uh, squatting tenants. I'll buy rental properties that I've never seen the inside of. And the way that I'm able to do that today is yes, it's very risky, but the most, the, the riskiest piece of it is the top of the portfolio. If we lost that, the entire portfolio will still stand, right? So you start off, Dan, going back to how much money I allocated for the first one, the, the first one, yeah, I had to put down 10 grand and I was like this scared. And my dad had to push me for the first one. But then I brand the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, boom, and then boom, boom, boom. And it started to get as the pyramid. Does that kind of make sense? Sure. Sure. So you're, I, I think you're creating a veil is the right term, a veil of protection, no, 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 but they no, are, no, they no, are. No, no, are no, no, no. Let me mute everyone and unmute you. Hold on. Mute all. And how do I un unmute yourself? I got Perfect. it. I got it. So you're yeah. creating a veil of protection through the LLC and because you're creating two LLCs, it gets very difficult to get to you personally. But if there was a, you know, like I said, loss of life, something absolutely tragic. I mean, it's not a hundred percent foolproof, but it's the absolute most protection you can give yourself. And, well, yeah, and absolutely. an umbrella policy on top as well. And remember, uh, Brian Carp doesn't own any rentals, right? The Correct. my port, my entities own all the rentals, right? And I don't even personally own that one of those single houses. My management company actually, you know, owns that LLC. So yes, there's multiple different. Uh, but that's only what, then, the, you know, everyone will spend hours and hours and years and years. Oh my God. You know, what if this happens, the corporate veil and LLC, I need 13 LLCs. Listen, the first five years, just run out there, be a man sure. man and buy rentals. And then once you start to have something that, you know, is that th there's an opportunity to be that this is big time. And this could really be something that could be passed on. Then you start to figure out how to structure it in the right manner. I want to answer Michael's question, but Mike, you know, I don't really read. Uh, can you touch more on selling and buying properties? The properties I bought in 2014, 15, 16, maybe. Yeah. So Mike, this is what I'm doing right now. And it's only cool because we've been buying for so long is I'm really going through the portfolio. And because the government inflated money so much and real estate went up so much, I'm looking through the portfolio. I'm like, I cannot believe this house is worth this. And so I've, I've already done it once this year. Uh, and I did a 1031 exchange. I did a little bit of a high level one and it was a uh, reverse 1031 rent, uh, reverse 1031 exchange with repair, which was really cool. So what I did is I ran out and found this amazing legal two family. I went into contract on it. Uh, it was a foreclosure and I needed to close on that immediately. So what I did is I closed on that. And then I put up one of my first, first, the first house that Jessica and myself ever bought 15 years ago. I put that in the market, sold that, rolled all of the money into the two family, right? So I did it in the reverse capacity, right? Normally you sell and then buy with the funds. I purchased and then sold. And then from there, there was an extra bucket of money. We took all the money and we're renovating this multifamily house. This new house that I bought has three different income streams from it. You know, this is a, re this is a retirement house. Uh, when, I, when I say retirement house, this is a house that will literally uh, put me to retirement, right? This house will literally uh, be something when I'm 50 and 60 years old, I will be talking to people about because this house will, you know, you get enough of these houses, you, you'll be financially free. Um, a few people emailed me before and wanted me to touch upon this. And then I promise I'll open it up to questions because we'll have some fun with that is they said, well, bro, I talked to me about financing some of these. Uh, I know Bill from Jersey. I know he'll watch the, the replay of this. Um, so he was like, well, bro, what, you know, how, how does it work with mortgages on these? Okay. So my portfolio, I, I don't believe in leverage. I believe in writing a check for it and purchasing it, but sometimes it takes a little while to do that. And listen, I could own a hundred doors today if I ran out and leverage stuff, right? I just don't 
I don't believe in it. I think that you could create enough money in your business and you can just start to put it into your portfolio. Yes, I started buying when things were cheaper, right? But um, money is cheap today from where it was 20 years ago, right? So that's how you guys have to look at everything. So, and even my first house I ever bought, you know, we, we took a mortgage on it, right? And then you'll get to a level if you decide that you don't want to mortgage stuff, that's totally your... Um, you know, it, that's up to you guys. So the way you could do it is there's so many different loans. What I would recommend is getting your first house first because your first house, you can get a primary mortgage on. Super easy, you know, best interest rate, as little, uh, as low money down as humanly possible. Then from there, you can get your secondary, which would be like an investment loan. Um, there are really cool products out right now that you don't even have to uh, have the income to support that rental. Right. And what I mean by that, and I'm sure Michael, because uh, I know he's a mortgage guy, but it could speak upon it and some other people in the room. But the, the, with with a lot of the products they have out now is all they care about is all they care about is that the property cash flows and the numbers make sense. So the cool thing is that literally if you guys ran around and found the right deals, right, just like I say all, all the time, money is money is easy. Money will come if you find the deal. Right, you guys find an incredible fix and flip opportunity, and you want to uh, do a, a joint venture. I'll partner with you if the numbers make sense, or I'll find a buddy of mine who will partner with you. Right, you just have to be able to find the deal. So if you find the right rental and the numbers make sense, there are plenty different lenders that will give you great interest rates on those properties, and they won't even look at your personal tax return or your credit score. Another strategy that a lot of my friends use is the Burr method, right? Which is basically purchase, rehab, and then refinance out. But you say, well, Brian, I don't have the money to purchase it. So the way you could do it is you could use a hard money lender, right? And if you need an introduction, I have plenty of hard money lenders uh, that I can introduce you to. And basically what a lot of my friends do is they'll purchase something with hard money. They will renovate it, right? And then I believe within six months, uh, they will bring in traditional financing and they will take all the money out of it, right? pay off their hard money lender and own the property. Uh, basically it's, you know, it's an infinite return because they'll have no money in that transaction. Um, some other questions that I got from emails prior, and then I promise we'll, we'll hit some questions with it, is the really, really cool thing about rental income is it's taxed a lot, lot less than our earned income. Right. So on my portfolio today, which is, you know, over 20 uh, doors, I literally paid almost zero in tax on that income. Totally legally, totally legitimately because of depreciation and because of stepped up depreciation. And what's a stepped up depreciation is you could take a larger loss on that property or that business, right? The first few years while you're doing major renovation to get the, to get it up and running. Um, the way that I structure the portfolio today is I love twos and three families. The first probably five or six years of buying, I really love buying single family houses. And the reason I love them is I would always look for stuff that was about a thousand square feet. I didn't care what the condition of the house was and I didn't care how many bedrooms it was. I just wanted to make sure it was a thousand square feet because with a thousand square feet or even 900 square feet, I know that I can go in there, uh, bring it down to the studs and turn it into a three bedroom, one bath or a three bedroom, two bath, right? And I knew that I was able to get maximum rent for that property. What I would always look for uh, on that was, I was always looking for low taxes because the one thing that will never change is the taxes, they'll only continue to go up. So my portfolio really kind of started in that Ronkonkoma area. And if you guys are out in Suffolk, the reason I loved it is about 15 years ago when I first got into this game, I was watching this one big corporation scoop up all the commercial property around the Ronkonkoma train station. And I was like, oh, wow, something's happening. This is before they even announced the hub, right? This is like you guys seeing, you know, um, um, Patrick before it blew up or Rockville Center before it blew up for my Nassau peeps. And I started buying these little 800, 900 square feet ranches right around the, the hub. And it was a little rough back then. And what I basically do would bring them down to the studs and I would re 
uh, organize the rooms and I would turn it into a three bedroom, one bath or a three bedroom, two bath. And that was really my business model for the first few years. Then I found that if I had a detached garage that was off to the side of the house, that that could be another income stream. So then I started looking for houses that had garages because, you know, everyone in the room who's a real estate agent, we know that, yeah, a detached garage is not really going to change the value all that much of the house. So I was like, all right, great. If I can grab some houses uh, that have detached garages, another income stream. Like today in my portfolio, I own a legal two family with a four car detached garage. And I just uh, up the rent on my garage tenant. And he's, he's really getting a great deal. He pays $700 a month for the garage of that property. Right. And that, and that is almost like owning self storage. So the model first was little single families. Now that I'm more experienced and the portfolio is much larger, we're starting to pick little single families in the portfolio. And we're starting to trade up and taking that money and moving it into two families and three families. What I will tell you is the single families do appreciate more, right? We were talking about, um, you know, cash flow and appreciation. So if you could, the, the single families may not cash flow as well as a two or three family, but they definitely appreciate better. So maybe if you're starting your portfolio, you could start with some single families and then you give it five, six, seven years, then you could start to take the money from those and do a 1031 exchange and move it in. And just for anyone on the call who doesn't know what a 1031 exchange is, it's just a way um, in the, the way to do, uh, it's a structure of moving money from one asset to another asset without having to pay any tax or any capital gains tax. Okay. And, you know, if you can continue to do a 1031 exchange, a 1031 exchange, you, you can, you know, uh, realistically pay no tax on the gains of it. So we basically started with all these little single families and now we're starting to move them into twos and threes. The reason I love twos and threes today is because there's multiple different streams um, coming in from each house. And generally, you know, you have one roof, but you could have two or three people underneath that roof. So if you had to replace that roof, it wouldn't cost you as much uh, as that. So I'm gonna take a sip uh, of my coffee and open it up to some questions. I have a handful, but I don't wanna take up everybody's time. All right, shoot one to open it up, Dan, and then we'll uh, we'll dive into other people. All right, so then this is kind of like a two part that'll be together. So, what what is your minimum cash flow you need per month uh, for an average size, whatever thousand square foot, you know, typical situation? And what's what's your your so called vetting procedure for the the financing or cash flow? Are you using like a one percent rule, a fifty percent rule, a two percent rule? All these things that are out there in the internet. So really cash flow yeah. per month and, and how are you determining what's a good buy? Mm -hmm. And so what I want is I want 10 to 12% of my money. So oh, that's cash on cash return. That's cash on cash return, but you could still but do that, separate. Dan, with, you could still do that with the money that you have in the deal, right? So if it's a, let's just say it's a $500,000 two family, right? Um, and you had to put down $50,000, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. And then with closing costs was another 15 grand. So now you're 65,000 into the deal after all of your expenses, right? You literally have $60,000 of, of money into that transaction. Mm -hmm. I wanna make sure I'm getting 10 to 12% on that money. On that money. But if, if you're not buying it outright and you have to hold a note, and let's just say the mortgage, you know, the, the, the principal interest taxes are 1,500 a month, but you can only get, you know, 1850 a month. I'm just using random numbers, 1850 yeah. a month. And you only have 350 left over, but you still have to include maybe lawn care and maybe you're holding the water bill because depending on where you are and stuff like that, you might only be cash flowing 50 bucks, a hundred dollars a month. Would you then still I would, then, I, then I wouldn't, then I wouldn't buy it. That's what I'm saying. So what, what yeah. would be your, your minimum cash flow then that you have to, or like, how would you work out those numbers that you say? I want to know what, I want to know how much, I want to know how much money I have in the transaction. Right. That's how I want to look at it. So whatever amount of money I have in the deal, I want to see that I'm getting that kind of return on the money. Does that make sense? So if I have $50,000 hard into that deal, I want to make sure that the 50 that I put out there, I'm making 10 to 12%. And you could absolutely, you could absolutely find it. You just have to hunt and search. They're definitely out there. And really to get that, you're going to have trouble with the single families right now because they went up so much. So really start looking at twos. 
I still see twos in Patchog that come on the market that will give this to you, right? You can grab a two in Patchog that needs a little love for 450, you know, 500, especially guys, listen, the reason I got the real estate license was to be the inside player, grab something off market. I just bought a, a gorgeous um, two family in Ronkonkoma, right? For $360,000. Beautiful, beautiful. The downstairs we're renting for $2,550 for a two bedroom, one bath downstairs. And the upstairs I'm waiting for two Gs. That was Taxes off market? Set, that was off market. And you say, well, but Bri, how'd you find it off market? The exact way I teach you guys to find listings or to find you know, potential sellers is go out and find them. Don't wait for it to hit the market. This was a gentleman who I became friends with seven years ago. He's 88 years old today. And I've built a relationship with him. And I said, Bob, if you ever go to sell the property, please, 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 please call me. And I checked in with him every few months. I checked in with him around the holidays. And once it got close to when he was kind of just done with it, he gave me the first opportunity. All right. Well, we'll come back to you, Dan. I know you, you still have some more questions. Who else uh, has a question? Let's jump right in. Sure. Who's talking me? Yeah, go artist. How did you create your construction crew? Like that's the only reason my husband and I don't pull the trigger on a, on a investment properties because we don't have crew. Sure. So um, today I have my own construction company. So I have a small group of uh, professionals who just work for me. And that's the real best way to keep costs down and to make sure that people are always showing up on the job and not having to bid things out and wait for a contractor to come to you. So that's where you would wanna get to, where I have a licensed electrician on payroll, I have a laborer on payroll, I have a carpenter on payroll, and basically what they do is they go from one of my house to the next house, to the next house, to the next house, right? But it didn't start off that way. So what I would do is I would find a, a general contractor that was starting his business and I would basically give him the entire job. What I basically did is put together, so here's an example, a house that I still own today um, in Lake Grove was I basically put together an entire spec of what needed to be done. And I met with a few different contractors and I put it all out to them for bid. What I said is I would buy the materials, right? You guys bid the labor and I would get them all together. And I was just passing them around until I found some people I was comfortable with. Don't, don't let that stop you from buying real estate. The biggest thing I, I promise you, Art, is that in 10 years, you'll wish you owned more real estate. And one other little tip with that is um, the best thing to do, Art, is try to buy something that doesn't need total renovation and total gutting because building costs is so expensive right now. And what I could tell you is I don't really, I bought a, a legal two family in Farmingville uh, late last year and the kitchens are really like original, like 1980s, but they're in great shape and I'm still getting great rent. And I didn't gut those kitchens because I can gut them, spend 10, 15 grand on a new kitchen. I'm really not going to get any more rent, right? The, the way I look at all the properties is what's going to get me the most rent. And, you know, here's a few things. There's no ceiling fans in any of my properties. I rarely ever put dishwashers in. Really? Why? Because it, yeah, because yeah. it won't affect, it won't affect rent. And I'm always going to get a call that is a broken dishwasher. I never, I never, ever put in washer and dryers. I put in washer and dryer hookups, but I don't put in washer and dryers. Why? Because tenants generally beat up or even anybody, I know Jessica and myself, we're always changing out our washer and dryer, right? But people beat up their washer and dryers. So what I do is I leave the houses plumbed for washer and dryers, but bring your own. I also, every one of my houses are paint the exact same color. Every one of my houses have the exact same flooring in it, right? So you start to build a, a blueprint and a model that works perfect for what your portfolio looks like. The biggest- And uh, no granite and stainless. What do you say? And there's no granite and stainless steel. No, the granite is as cheap as 
you know, cheap stone and granite is something that they generally can't break. So yes, I do put granite in all the properties or courts. It's not that expensive if I'm upgrading the kitchen. If not, then whatever kitchen's there, if it's not falling down, I'm just leaving it. Hey, Brian, Conti here. Question in regards to your uh, level of flooring, um, uh, thickness uh, with durability. Is it a certain uh, millimeter of thickness that you normally use for your, uh, your uh, it's rental? A, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mid-level luxury laminate, right? I put it through every house. I put it through the bathrooms, Conti. I put it through the kitchen, right? Um, you know, yeah. th this is literally, there could be, you know, there could be uh, a murder in one of my houses, right? And this luxury laminate is like a plastic. They could just wipe up the blood and move the people out and put the next people in. I'm obviously joking around with that, but it's just, it's the most durable things. That's why I put it straight through the bathrooms. Um, big right. thing is basements. Be very, very careful with finishing basements. I generally don't finish basements. Uh, if it's a new house in the portfolio, we'll gut the basement down to the stone. We'll paint the stone, right? We'll gut the ceiling just because um, a lot of basements in Long Island flood and get wet and you don't want it to be like a living space or anything like that. I do have a legal two family that I have people who live in the basement, but I have egress windows in there. Now it's not a separate dwelling the, my tenants occupy the first floor and the second floor and the basement. So what I did is I knew that they, were, they have a large family. I, so what I did is I put an egress window in there. God forbid there was ever an issue. I see uh, Victoria had a question um, and always feel free just to interrupt me. I'm going to try to read them, but you guys know that reading is not my skill. My entire portfolio is based in Suffolk County. My entire portfolio is probably based in five towns that are literally right around where I live and where I do business. And you say, why? It's because I'm the inside player here. And every single one of you guys are the inside players here in Long Island. So will I ever invest out of state? The answer is no, because I will get ripped off and I will not be the inside player, right? About five years ago, um, I started to look at some of the properties in the portfolio and I was like, holy cow, like, why don't I sell one of these? It's probably worth 600 grand. I'll take that money. I'll do a 1031 exchange. I'm going to roll it into an apartment building um, down. I don't know, Conti, give me one of the areas you're buying in. <laughs> Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis. All right. All right. I like that right down in Tennessee. And I was like, I'm going to own a, a 50 unit apartment building. And I was like, and I, I was really dead set. I started to talk to some of my boys who own uh, big apartment buildings uh, just because I was like, all right, you know, let me flex myself. Let me bring it to the next level. And then I, I sit down with one of my friends and he's like, Brian, get back in your lane. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, dude, you are the guru of residential and multifamily real estate in Suffolk County in about 20 towns. What are you doing buying in Memphis, Tennessee? And he's like, you're going to get your ass, you know, uh, clobbered. And he was probably right. Yes, I would have figured it out, but I probably, Conti would have paid retail, right? And I probably, it would have, yes, the appreciate, yes, the cash flow is better down there. And yes, you know, it's easier to evict tenants down there. Yes, I, I don't disagree with that but I am the player here. Every single one of you guys are the players here in your local market. So that's why I invest here. And even though it's, it's not very landlord friendly, and even though it's really hard to do business in New York, I love the challenge, right? I'm not gonna, you know, this is where I wanna live. This is where my mother is. This is where my family is. I'm not gonna pick up and move just because it's easier to play somewhere else, right? I wanna play in the hardest, uh, in the hardest division possible. D1, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, anyone jump in? I'm going to try to read some of the questions. In... How are you but vetting tenants? Uh, go, Dan. What do you say? How are you vetting tenants? Are you using NTN? What's your ratio of earnings, minimum credit score, et cetera? Yeah, uh, I actually, and it's not a plug for my property management company, but I do not uh, rent any of my units. Um, and if you guys are not local to my property management company, find one near you, right? Um, but I have my property management company who rents all of my units because I want, I don't want the, I want to have a level in between me and my tenants, right? I highly recommend either opening up your own management company if you start building out your portfolio, right? That's the only way that Jessica and myself were able to really scale this because Going back to Art's question, and, and I'm going to hit on it too, Dan, is that 
it's all fun, right? When you could sit back now today and have a huge portfolio, but there's a lot of learning curve, right? When we went from five doors to 10 doors, we literally had a panic attack because there's always something breaking in one of your properties, right? So how do we solve that was we hired a handyman that just worked for us, right? So we had to, and it was, it was a guy who worked three days a week for me and I paid him per day. Right. So then once, once the poor, that was good when we had 10, but then when we went to 20, we had to bring out a full-time guy. Right. So you'll start to, you start to scale it within what you're doing. Uh, but today I have my property management company rent out all the properties, but Dan, uh, they don't need to have perfect credit. Right. To me, credit is not the uh, be all end all, and it's not someone's exact financial uh, scope. I just kind of want to make sure that they have good, stable income. I want to make sure that they um, have some money in reserves. I want to make sure that they um, can afford their lifestyle and all of their liabilities and also the rent. And I want to just make sure that if they have uh, blips on their credit, Dan, that it was the reason that something happened, right? Medical, divorce, right? Big life things. And not just, hey, I decided I, I was going to put on my credit card, go into Belize, and I didn't pay it. So you, you don't have any specific uh, advice as far as how you would vet a tenant? I would want, I would want, how to vet the tenant is if you're meeting them, you know, listen, I'm a very good judge of character. You're going to meet them. You're going to want to chase back where they were living before. Like, I, I want the story. And then I want to vet the story and see why they are a tenant. Sure. Right. Um, I'd say a third of my portfolio, I rent to a non-for-profit. It's not a uh, section eight, but it's a non-for-profit uh, for people who are working programs and people who uh, have some um, uh, mental challenges. So um, I have a great success with them. So there's a lot of amazing non-for-profits out there and they're great tenants, even though some of the organizations don't take care of the properties as well as single individuals do. But wh when I look at it is in a perfect world, you'd want the rent to be a third, right, of their total household income. But unfortunately, it's New York is expensive and rents are very expensive, which is great for us. Um, I'm happy with half, right, somewhere in that matter. Uh, right. And I just want to see that they have stable employment. I'd like to have a two income household um, with that. I don't have any today college rentals. I don't really love them. I had one um, and we rented rooms right around Stony Brook. But even though the cash flow was lovely, it was kind of a pain in the butt. The, the kids would really mess up the property and we were always having an issue uh, with the tenants. Uh, Rich's question is, do you find most of your properties off market? I'd say I'm always searching. Um, a lot of them are coming off market today, but I'm buying, I bought a three family in Smithtown um, six months back that was on market. So there's definitely some good deals still out there, yes. You know, we always say if it's on, if you're, if it's on the real estate market, it's not a deal anymore. That's why I always tell everyone, put your house in the market because that's how you get market value. And if it's off market, you take a chance of, of not getting top dollar out of it. But there's plenty of tired landlords who own one or two properties that will sell it to you at a discount to not deal with the headache of having to remove the tenants and having to put it on the market and show it with tenants inside it. Yeah, I'm also finding those uh, on the MLS a lot, like uh, no access inside and stuff like that. So but as a new investor, particularly, would you suggest that, though, taking on a, pro a, a property? Absolutely. You take, on, you take on someone's head. We solve headaches, right? Mm -hmm. As real estate agents, your job is to solve, to solve a problem. As a real estate investor or someone who owns multifamily property, to me, if, if I could solve a problem for somebody, I could you know, get it at a discount. The house that I bought uh, in Ronkonkoma late last year, the legal two family. I just muted everyone. So Kathy, unmute yourself if we're still chatting. But the reason why that gentleman sold it to me at a discount is I took it with both tenants, right? One was leaving. The other one was gonna leave. So I took a little risk because I took it with both tenants because it's generally hard to sell a house that has tenants inside. So just because they don't want to give access and, and just so you guys know, leases supersede the sale. So what does that mean is that just because you sell a house 
if there's a lease in place, that lease actually supersedes the sale of the house. So uh, you can't just sell a house tomorrow. If I have a lease until September, I could stay till September. And we all know that New York real estate is super, super hard to evict somebody, right? I'm walking through an eviction right now um, of a house that I bought in December. I don't think we're going to be, be able to even get to court until August. But you have to look at, yeah, but listen, you don't take anything personally, right? We're all businessmen and businesswomen just factor into the deal. And I'm not going there, kicking the door down, pushing the people out. Right. I asked them to leave. I offered them some money. It was a house I bought with a squatting tenant in it, but I got it at a discount because I solved the problem. And, you know, I offered them some key cash for keys. They didn't want to play that game, which is fine. So we sent it to the attorney and now I'm waiting for my day in court. Okay. So your estimation, what's the average around about on evictions these days now in New York? Yeah, I, I would allocate 5k all the ones that I've walked through ended up costing me about $5,000. And that's not in lost rent. That's from what the attorneys cost from um, uh, paying a process server to serve them paying. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but you have to pay the sheriff to move their stuff on the front lawn. Right. Uh, and then you have to hire a special moving company only that works with the sheriff to move their stuff to the front lawn. Right. And you have to store some of their stuff. Sometimes it's New York is terrible to be a landlord. But I'm still telling you to buy, buy, buy. But it is very, very, very difficult. So you, you got to have a tolerance for it. You got to build a stomach for it. So uh, I always, I always allocate 5K anytime I have to walk through an eviction. And what's your time? What's the timeline from the beginning of it to the finalizing and getting them out? What's, what's the time frame? You before COVID, Conti, it used to be uh, I'd say 120 days. Uh, now I would allocate yourself six months. Because depending on when people, depends on uh, how you're going to do the eviction, right? It, it, uh, it, it either could be that um, non-payment, right? That's one way of doing it. Or the other way of doing it is it's called a holdover, right? And it all depends on how long they've been in the property. And don't call me on this, right? I'm definitely not the expert in it. But if you have to serve them a certain amount of time, right? So if they, if it's a, a one-year lease, I believe you can serve them a 30-day notice. If it's a three-year lease, it's a 60-day. And if it's anything more than a three-year lease, you got to give them a 90-day notice. But Conti, it's a 90-day notice just to appear to court. Then you appear to court and they can postpone it. They could have some issues. Then the judge has to give them a timeline, right? So the one that I'm walking through in Ronkonkoma right now, um, that woman has been in the property for over a decade. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's gonna be a long haul, but it's worth it, right? And listen, it's all delayed gratification. Like I love having to wait to receive my benefit. And what's my benefit is getting her out. We're gonna renovate the property. We're gonna make it brand new. I'm gonna rent it out and I'm gonna receive another stream of income forever. Got a few more minutes left. Um, anyone else jump in on some questions? Yes, quickly, Brian. Mm -hmm. So um, I encountered a, a builder, so old man, maybe in his 80 years old. Uh, he used to build a lot of homes. And um, somehow I did a tour on one of the properties, a three family home, but it has a lot of violations. Um, how do you deal with that? And yeah, so a lot a good of price too. He's selling for a good price. You should buy it, Conti, right? The reason I have a real estate license is I get to, uh, it's not Conti, I'm sorry, uh, Shafiq. Shafiq um, yes. You should buy it, right? Oh, every, <laughs> every, every, every time I get a call from a multifamily person, of course, I always tell them, put it on the market because that will get you the best money. But I'm always looking at it for myself. So the nice thing is you get first dibs at it. Shafiq, you should literally spend today and try to strategize a way, even if you're bringing in partners or friends for you to buy that. Be honest, show him what the market value is, but also explain to him with violations is a pain in the butt. Will I buy something with violations? Yes, but I would want a discount for it because you're probably going to have to clean up those violations. Um, it's just, and it, it's very easy. It's just looking at what the rent roll of the property is or what's the potential rent roll, right? And then coming up with a value of it. Just remember when you get past uh, three family properties, you evaluate them differently, right? With Single family homes, we do comps, right? We look at similar homes that sold. I don't need to go into that. You guys all know that. But when you start looking at multifamily properties, right? Anything more, I believe, than three family, had it, uh, you're going to look at a cap rate, 
right? So it's going to be what rents are, right? And that's kind of how you determine the cap rate of it. And the cool thing is, is that if you buy something like I'm looking right now, I put an offer in on a four family with really, really low rents. I could literally do nothing to the house and change the value $200,000. How? I could buy it, right? Rip out all the tenants in a nice way, right? But rip out all the tenants, maybe clean up the units a little bit, rent them at market value. And then I could resell the house or the, the multifamily property. And it would sell for a lot more just because people are going to buy it on the cap rate, which is a cool strategy. And there's a lot of developers in the boroughs that do that. They buy, you know, 10 family properties and they rip out the tenants. They release them at a much higher value and then they sell it uh, or they refinance it, pay off all of their investors, and then they own the asset. Okay. I'm just scrolling through the questions, see if I missed anything. Uh, do I ever look at commercial? Uh, gee, I would definitely look at commercial, but I want to make sure it has some type of residential in it or some type of, because commercial, as we saw with COVID, sometimes it changes. And I'm not a huge, I don't own any commercial properties. I only own multifamilies. So would I buy a commercial? I would if it had maybe some apartments up top, right? Because I know it could always lease those. People always need somewhere to live, but they don't always need somewhere to work. So um, I would buy a commercial, but I would want to make sure that it had uh, a lease at residential, <clears throat> a residential piece in it. Awesome. I got time for a few more questions if anyone wants to jump in. Yeah, so Brian, um, in regards to um, foreclosures and things like that, how you go about your, that process of obtaining a home that way? Yeah, so it, it's the same way as, you know, if the same way as if I was buying a house to flip it, there's a few different ways, right? You can buy it off the MLS off an REO broker, but it's probably not a deal anymore right? You can go to the courthouse steps, which I go to the courthouse steps all the time. Um, but it's a full-time job to do that. Uh, there's a different, a bunch of different list services that you can purchase that gives you all the foreclosure auctions. And then you'll go to different towns, right? You go to Brookhaven, you go to Islip. Uh, I don't buy in Nassau County. So yeah. Nassau County or Queens, uh, people would have to know those, but Smithtown, they all have different, you know, townships where they literally auction off the houses. Uh, you got to buy them in cash, and you have to have 10% there in hand to uh, give to the referee. There's also a bunch of you know, websites online, auction.com and Hubzoo. Those sell a lot of Fannie and Freddie's uh, distressed assets. Um, they're kind of like eBay for houses. I have purchased off of those, but they're kind of, you, you know, you got to hunt them. They're better than buying off the MLS, but there's still a lot of people know about them, right? The real, real best deals are go direct to a seller right? It's, it's, it's really, it's simple guys, just figure out in life what you want and go directly to that person, right? So today we're, I'm looking to purchase something on the North Fork, um, which is, I'm looking to buy something as like a, a secondary, like a vacation home uh, that we may or may not Airbnb from time to time. And I want it to be literally on the water of the North Fork with a crazy sunset. So I am not searching the MLS, I am literally calling people who own houses on the North Fork and asking them if they want to sell, right? To me, it's so simple. You, everyone complicates everything. I, I know what I want. I'm just gonna go ask the people who have it to see if they're interested in selling it, as I do with multifamilies, right? I'm looking to purchase more multis always. I'm going direct to consumer, right? To find people who might need to sell it. I'll take one more question and then we'll wrap up. I want to be mindful of everyone's uh, Friday. Brian, uh, good morning. When you uh, go in the listing presentation and you say it's a fixer upper um, and, and you obviously want that property for yourself, how do you let them know, obviously, that uh, you can list it for them for top dollar, but that you also are interested in buying it for yourself? Mm -hmm. um, today, I do flip houses, not a ton. I'll do a few a year just to keep myself out of trouble. But all flipping houses does is make you a pile of money. But really, you know, a pile of money doesn't change someone's life. A stream of income does, right? So that's how I always look at that. So my, my eyes are not looking to flip houses. I'm looking always for more multis, more multis, more multis for the portfolio. So to me, some of the, the best deals that I've ever gotten in between um, was people that I really came from my heart. And I'll always, always tell people you got to put on the market, guys. 
that will always get you top dollar. Does not matter the condition, doesn't matter the violations, doesn't matter if it's on fire. Going on the market and us putting it on MLS will always get you the most money possible. Now, you're going to have to take a huge discount from the market value if it goes out there to the masses, but you'll always get more, right? You know, if the house is on fire, literally on fire, right, we may be able to buy it for 150 grand, but on the MLS, they'll sell it for two, not on fire, it's worth three, right? So always, always put them to that. Um, I, I did purchase something about five or six years ago. It was one of my biggest... Um, you know, biggest transactions of my career financially. And it was somebody who had a house in um, East Northport and they were selling it to a cash buyer. I was introduced to the person through um, an attorney that I do business with as the broker. And I came in and I said, guys, like, let me put this on the market in as is condition. I don't need running water. I don't need, it's got black mold and it doesn't matter. We can get 300,000 for it. I'll put it up for 299 and we can get 300,000 for it. And they said, no, we have a cash buyer who's going to buy it for 210,000. I said, but guys, you're leaving 80, $90,000 on the table. We want a quick transaction. I said, but putting on the MLS, I could find and market to cash buyers, right? I can get you the, qu the quick transaction. They didn't want to hear it. So I said, okay, well, how about I give you 10 grand higher and all cash no contingencies, at least you know that I'm really cash, right? And not like a lot of the other investors that are wholesalers, right? They try to lock up the transaction and then flip it to someone else, right? I ended up purchasing it, did exactly what I said I was gonna do, gave them an extra 10 grand, sent flowers to the closing. They love me, we hug, we kiss, right? What I do, I did nothing, put it right back in the market and made a six figure payday. And the reason that happened was because I, I, I came from my heart. I beg and pleaded them to let me put it on the market. They wouldn't hear it. So I gave them more than what they were getting for the house, right? I gave them certainty that I am not hot, like, you know, I'm a person of integrity. I, this is all I do. I'm, there's nothing I hide or there's no secrets. I put it all out there. Let them know, disclose. You always got to disclose, right? That you're a licensed real estate agent or the entity buying it is held by a licensed real estate agent. They did not want to deal with any of that, even though I begged and pleaded them, right? Even their attorney to let me put it out there to the masses. They didn't want to do it. So then I stepped in, I solved their problem, right? Gave them more than somebody else, gave them certainty. And then I was able to profit on the back end. So I think it's just, you know, to answer your question with that, uh, because I'm a storyteller, it's just being totally upfront and honest, saying, listen, no one really knows what it's worth until it's out there to the masses. Looking at the, the comps and the numbers, it's probably worth X. I do buy houses. If you're interested, you know, I could totally do this, but I'm got to pay Y for it, right? It's completely up to you and really push them for what's best to them. And it will always lead back to what is good for you if you serve them in the right manner. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, lead from your heart. And I promise you, it will always, always pay for you huge dividends because it has for me. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, this was by far one of my favorite topics because this really is uh, my passion and my hobby uh, and what drives my real estate business and what drove me into real estate 15 years ago was rental real estate. So thank you for being a part of it. Go crush the day, win the day, uh, and um, we'll see you guys soon. Thanks, Brian. Great job. Man. Thanks, G. Appreciate it. That was amazing. Thank you. My pleasure.